Is Xbox forcing Sony to lower the PS5's price? Should Sony stop skipping E3? We've got new updates on Ghost of Tsushima's Iki expansion, and also we've got a ton of new details on GTA 5's PS5 patch. Patch? Re-release. It's a PS5 upgrade. So I saw an article going around on the internet this week that was basically questioning whether or not Sony made the right decision to stop going to E3. Now, Sony hasn't been there for a couple of years, and I think the reason they stopped is because the last time they're at E3, they only showed off a couple games. I think it was like The Last of Us Part Two and Ghost of Tsushima, and that was about it. There was no third party stuff. There were no real big game announcements. It was all just very weird and people didn't like it. So Sony went nuclear and said, all right, we're done going to E3. Cause when we don't have stuff to show, people get upset and then we're pressured to have stuff to show. So we're just canceling it all. And at that time, they also had PlayStation Experience, which I've been to both E3 and PlayStation Experience. And as like a fan show where you get to see new games and try them out, PlayStation Experience was a lot cooler. I got to go to the first one where they announced The Last of Us Part Two, which was dope. I also got to play Resident Evil 7 for the first time there before that game came out. So like, yeah, I feel like at the time skipping E3 was a good move, but this year alone also highlighted one very negative thing about Sony not being at E3. So for the past few years, Microsoft hasn't really done a whole lot at E3. They've had showcases where they show off games that everyone's expecting, like Gears 5, Halo Infinite was shown like a hundred times. They always show off a new Forza game and then like 500 indie games that might be Xbox exclusives, but might be timed exclusives. And then they don't even say, one way or the other, which is which, so people just get confused and it's kind of lame. But this year, Microsoft had like 5 million new games. They were just like, game, 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 exclusive, exclusive, exclusive. We got Stalker 3, we got Redfall, we've got new stuff from Bethesda, we've got Starfield, we've got all these awesome games being announced. And then Sony had a state of play where they talked about Horizon Forbidden West exclusively. You know, like Horizon is definitely going to be better than a lot of games that Microsoft showed off, but Microsoft showed off a bunch of good games, which made Sony look bad. That's the point here. So I'm not willing to say one way or the other whether or not Sony is screwing up by not being at E3 because I feel like you've got just as many good uh, outcomes from them not being there as bad. But I also, I wish they were there because there used to be some really cool stuff like you'd walk down this long hallway, right? And on one side would be this massive wall with the Xbox logo. And on the left side would be this massive wall with the PlayStation logo. Sony always had a really cool booth. They had sweet lighting. They always had some really cool games you could try out and have fun with. So it was nice to have Sony there right next to Microsoft because Sony also picked up the slack on a lot of third party stuff like Call of Duty was always shown at E3 at Sony's event and Sony had some really cool events. So I feel like they could come back, but also if the other option on the table is bringing us another PlayStation experience, that's what I'd rather go with. Sony is much better when they're doing their own fan convention rather than trying to cater to everyone at E3, if you know what I mean. Since there aren't a ton of native PS5 games coming out right now, Ghost of Tsushima is the one that everyone's really interested in and I get why that ps5 patch that's making it run at 4k and at 60 frames per second looks incredible i think it's sweet that they're lip syncing the japanese voice pack that was released for the game because that was kind of a weird thing when you would see english being spoken in the game, but then the audio would be Japanese. I wasn't really used to that. So knowing that they're doing these cool little small updates is awesome. Also getting the like dual sense support on the controller, that's even cooler. And another cool thing they're doing to celebrate the one year anniversary of Ghost of Tsushima is they put costumes inspired by other big PlayStation games into the Legends mode, and they all look really sick. We've got one inspired by Shadow of the Colossus, which might be my favorite because you've got the sweet Colossus mask. We've also got one inspired by Aloy's get up in Horizon Zero Dawn, which looks great. We've got a Bloodborne one, which, you know, that one's my favorite because I love Bloodborne. It's also all black and like the hat is really cool looking. And then finally, there's one that's inspired by God of War. And I gotta be honest, this one just looks like cool samurai armor. I feel like they went very loose with the God of War uh, inspiration there. But either way, these are four free costumes you can get for the Legends mode, which is a ton of fun. And all you have to do is beat one run in a Legends level with each of the four classes. So these are very easy to get costumes. I feel like it's totally worth jumping back in, especially if you haven't played in a while. And speaking of Ghost of Tsushima, we actually just got the full trailer for the Iki expansion. And I gotta be real with you guys, I am way more impressed with how this looks than I thought it was going to be. So the coolest thing for me is that this looks like it's gonna be a little bit horror themed. Like it seems like the Iki Island has a Mongol cult on it instead of it just being more Mongols that you go kill on the island. There's real fear in Jin's eyes when he hears that there's Mongols there. Like it, it seems like they're going to be harder to take on than the Mongols in the main game, which is kind of crazy. The 
island itself also looks a lot more dense with like trees and foliage and stuff like that, which is what I'm into. It looks very summery and fun to play in, which is cool. I also saw on Twitter that there are different places all over the island where you can have different animals come and like hang out with you and you can pet them and stuff. I saw a cat in one of the trailers, but they said there's gonna be even more animals that you can make friends with, which is really cool in my opinion. It doesn't really do anything for the game. It's just like cute and fun. This expansion, which costs 30 bucks alongside the PS5 upgrade is definitely going to take advantage of all the PS5's features. It was sweet to see it running at 60 frames per second with the new resolution. The new lighting looks amazing. There was one shot that really stood out to me where Jin's riding his horse down a road and there's like fireworks going off at what looks like a Mongol camp. And just the lighting there, that definitely looked ray traced to me. I'm not entirely sure if it is ray traced, but if it's not, they definitely tricked me, which is dope. And yeah, I thought this was initially going to be like the Horizon Zero Dawn expansion, which you could kind of play in the middle of the game and it was basically just like a combat gauntlet that didn't really have a huge story, but this looks like it's going to be a full on little story expansion, which is really cool. They didn't really show off any new items or armor sets or swords or abilities or anything like that. I'm glad they're holding that close to their chest because there's gotta be at least a couple new upgrades you can get from this expansion, but at least the story is going to be as full featured as the main game, if not a little bit shorter. I can't believe I'm saying this because the original version came out in 2013, but one of the most anticipated games for PS5 that's hopefully coming this year is Grand Theft Auto 5. Now people are really wondering what the big upgrades are going to be beyond like simple graphical stuff like better lighting or at least just making it look as good as the PC version but there are going to be at least a couple new things because Rockstar announced that coming exclusively to the PS5 version is the ability to upgrade a few of the different cars that you can get in GTA Online. Like you can change the speed, you can tune them a little bit, you know simple stuff like that that makes people excited to spend more money on GTA Online. The one thing I'm really curious about though with this new release of GTA 5 is if it's going to cost a full $70 or if they're finally going to say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't charge full price for a game that came out in 2013. Because when the PS4 came out and they re-released GTA 5 on that with a few upgrades, they charged a full $60 for it. And people were like, well, they added a first person mode where you can play it like an FPS and they added some new graphical stuff. But I don't know, overall, it just felt a little weird to pay 60 bucks again for GTA 5. And then it was even crazier a year after that when they re-released it on PC again for a full 60 bucks. So Rockstar, they know what they can get out of people, but I feel like now if they're saying like, hey, you gotta spend a full 70 on GTA 5, that's not gonna fly. This is an old game. Whatever updates they're doing aren't adding new content. They're just doing small tweaks. So hopefully this comes out and it's like 30 bucks or at the very least is like a full upgrade if you already own it on the PS4 because that's what it really deserves. This game did not get a PS4 Pro patch. So I feel like the middle ground there is saying if you owned it digitally or on disc on PS4, you get a free upgrade. Since Microsoft has been buying up a bunch of studios that already had games in the works for PS5, I actually always thought it was really cool that they were still releasing the PS5 versions of these games and getting them out of the way before making these studios exclusive. Like how Deathloop is coming to the PS5 exclusively, even though something like Starfield, which is a new game from Bethesda Studios, is coming to Xbox exclusively, you know, stuff like that. But I gotta say, I'm pretty disappointed in the way they're releasing Psychonauts 2. So there are like 15 million different consoles this is going to be played on. So I'm just gonna read all the different resolutions here on my phone. So if you play this game on Xbox One, its max resolution is 1080p and it runs at 30 frames per second. On Xbox One X, it's 4K, 30 frames per second. On Series S, it's 1440p and you can play it at 60 or 120. Okay. Then on Series X, you get the best version possible, 4K at 60 frames per second or 120. Now you'd think that would be the exact same on PS5, but they're not actually releasing a PS5 version of the game. They're capping it off at the PS4 Pro version, which is 1440p, 60 frames per second, which is weird again, because the PS5 does not even natively output at 1440p. So why is Xbox being dumb here? Why are they releasing this game that they're making be available in 4K on the Series X, which by all intents and purposes is basically the same as the PS5 without the PS5 upgrades. It doesn't seem fair. So like, I don't want to defend this practice, but I feel like with Psychonauts 2, there's a few different reasons why this could be happening. First of all, Psychonauts 2 is well past its point of where it's actually going to hit. I think this game was announced a long time ago. The original Psychonauts was like a mild hit on PS2, but I don't think it got anywhere past cult classic. So Microsoft's probably looking at it and being like, well, we have Game Pass. 99% of the people who play this game are going to just download it for free on Game Pass. I don't think we're gonna recoup the development costs there. So let's just put it on PS4, not worry about a PS5 version and call it a day. If this happened with something like Minecraft, I feel like it would be a much bigger issue
issue. I know that updates come slower to PlayStation on Minecraft, but usually the updates come. We'll just have to keep an eye on Microsoft and make sure they don't do more stuff like this in the future. One of the biggest downsides with Sony having two of the biggest and most recognizable directors in the gaming industry over on their camp is that sometimes they kind of got to play Twitter police. So a couple videos ago, right after the director's cut for Death Stranding was announced, we had to talk about how Hideo Kojima went on Twitter and was saying, yeah, I don't know why they're calling it a director's cut. The first version of the game was the director's cut because I directed it and I released it and I didn't cut any content from that. I'm just adding on content to this new release. So I don't know why Sony is calling it a director's cut. And now Corey Barlog, the guy who directed God of War 2018 is uh, saying that Sony is overpricing the PS5 in South America. So the prices of consoles in South America have always been weird, specifically in Brazil, because they impose insane tariffs on importing that stuff over there. So they're still working with consoles like the Sega Genesis, I'm pretty sure, or like the Dreamcast, or maybe even the original Xbox and PS2, because those are the only affordable consoles that can be readily bought down there. So obviously people were up in arms when Corey Barlog responded to this guy saying that the pricing was bullshit because in Brazil, it seems like it costs five months worth of minimum wage work just to get a PS5. But I don't think he was blaming Sony there. He's obviously blaming the tariffs that make the PS5 so expensive down there. But obviously people just wanna shit on PlayStation now because they're the ones on top. So they turned this into a whole thing, tried to get Corey Barlog in trouble. But for all of you God of War fans out there, I am going to say that I think everything just went over fine because I didn't see this as a controversy for more than a couple hours. One of the biggest headlines I've seen going around the internet the past few days is that the Xbox managed to outsell the PS5 in June. But then when you click on the articles, there are a lot of caveats as to how they did it. First of all, they have the Xbox Series Series X and S. They're two different consoles that when combined equal one number. And a lot of people are buying the Xbox Series S mainly because it's available and it's also $300 compared to the cheapest PS5 being $400 or like 700 if you buy it from a scalper. So for the past year, the PlayStation 5 has been the most in-demand console pretty much ever. Like it's really the best-selling console in the US of all time at this point, even with the insane supply constraints that have been put on it thanks to everything that's happening right now. The Xbox on the other hand has been in demand but it's been pretty easy to get one if you want one. You just gotta make sure you're there when they go up on certain sites like Amazon or Walmart or Target. And if you just try a couple times, it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll get a Series X. Or if you really want a Series S, that one's even easier to get. So knowing that Microsoft has had a much easier time getting these things on shelves than Sony has with their PS5, when you look at the E3 experience that we had last month where Xbox absolutely blew it out of the water with stuff like Redfall, Starfield, Elder Scrolls 6, everything that they talked about or showed off at the show, they had the Xboxes available for people who may have turned and wanted them. Because if I'm someone who really just wants a next gen console and I've been trying for months to get a PS5 and those things are online for like a thousand bucks and I know I can go to the store and get an Xbox, all of those games being announced would just be the thing to push me over, right? I could say, well, I can get a Series S now for 300 bucks and then when the PS5 is more available, I can get that and all the games I really want for it will be cheaper. And that makes sense to me. Like that's what I would do if I hadn't gotten a PS5 at this point in time. As for whether or not Sony should be worried about this, I really don't think so. We've seen for months now that literally the second PS5s go on sale, they sell out. And when scalpers are trying to flip them for $750 to $1,000, they're actually selling. Like people really want PS5s and they're either committed to getting them at retail or they're biting the bullet and just paying more for them. But either way, they're buying more PS5s. So like, yeah, we have one month where the Xbox outsold the PS5. If this keeps happening month over month, like for the next six months, the Xbox starts out selling it, Sony's gonna have to make some changes. There's no question there, but I don't think it's worth getting like up in arms about saying that Microsoft is winning the console war right now over one month of sales. Also, the headlines are all like, the Xbox outsold the PS5. And then you see the little subtext and it's like in total dollar sales. So it's not even raw numbers. So yeah guys, that's all the PlayStation news I have for you today. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you let me know what you think of all of it down in the comments below. And remember, if you wanna stay PS ready, subscribe and set your notifications to all. As always guys, my name is Jimmy Champagne and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.